Venezuela is a country in South America that makes up much of the northern coast of the continent, bordered by the Atlantic Ocean to the north, Colombia to the west, and Guyana to the east. It's about the size of Texas, which is a very large state. It's also about four times as large as the United Kingdom, three times larger than Germany, and about one-fourth the size of India. Going back a ways in history, Archaeologists have found evidence of tool-making humans in the region that we currently call Venezuela as far back as around 15,000 to 9,000 BP, BP meaning before present, which is a common time measurement system used in radiocarbon dating. That means the people living in this region back when these tools were made would have coexisted with elephant-sized sloths called megatheriums, tank-like proto-armadillos called glyptodonts, and a sort of rhino, sort of hippo-like mammal that is believed to have been hunted to extinction by early humans, called the Toxodon. Tribal structures are believed to have been established in this region from around 9,000 to 7,000 BP until 1,000 BP, which was a period defined by the development of sophisticated agricultural methods and complex societal structures, which allowed them to build pre-planned villages, technologically advanced, for the time anyway, irrigation and terracing methods, and reliable methods of water capture and storage that made good use of the local landscape and weather patterns. The population in this region is estimated to have grown to a stable one million people, leading up to the end of this period, which was ended by the locals' conquest by Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century AD. That description I should mention, does not do justice to the incredible art, culture, history, and belief systems that evolved in this region before the Spanish arrived. Part of the reason we often gloss over this period in this part of the world is that the history was either destroyed by the European conquerors when they arrived, because they were focused on spreading their beliefs, their traditions, their way of doing things, and thus wanted to eliminate all remnants of what came before, often by burning and breaking and purging the population, of those who did not submit, or in some cases because that information was maintained via oral tradition, or using writing systems that fell out of vogue, or beyond remembrance, shortly after the new systems arrived. So while there was plenty going on before the Spanish stepped in and started claiming this part of South America for themselves, a lot of what was happening we only know from archaeological evidence and imperfect interpretations of oral tradition that managed to survive in some form. And that's left us with a lot of uncertainty and misinformation, alongside the bits that we've probably gotten at least partially right. That said, shortly after the Spanish came in and claimed this region for themselves, which meant their king, and for the Catholic Church, a process which began in earnest around the year 1522, Charles I, the King of Spain, granted colonial rights to the province of Venezuela to a banking family called the Welsers, who were German, and who were owed a debt by the king. This family was keen to explore the region because of rumors that the mythical land of El Dorado might be located in the area, and thus, the family sent explorers out to map the land, to set up basic infrastructure to support that mapping, and to establish the fundamental trading systems they were building alongside the local equivalents. After all that exploration, though, the Welser's representative thereabouts returned to the then capital of the region, Santa Ana de Coro, and was declared to have taken too many liberties in his governance of the region when the Spanish leaders were away. He was executed, and the family had their charter revoked. About a century later, in 1632, there were still only a few thousand Europeans living in what is today Venezuela, but the opening of gold mines in the area that year dramatically increased the overall population though mostly through the introduction of slavery, both of the indigenous population and then later by bringing enslaved Africans to the region to work the mines. A sort of feudal system emerged in the following years when a type of livestock-based economy emerged, with a whole lot of local herdsmen at the bottom of the pyramid and far fewer Spanish landholders up top, managing the rest of them like serfs from an earlier European time. Other parts of South America, which had been more heavily settled by the Aztecs and Incas before the Europeans arrived, were better positioned to take advantage of the mineral wealth 
of the continent. So those settlements received more attention and resources from the Spanish government than the relatively neglected Venezuelan region, which, as a consequence, doubled down on herding and didn't grow very quickly in comparison to nearby Peru and parts of what was then called New Spain, which at its peak made up most of the United States, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America. That changed a bit after another hundred years in the 18th century, as more slaves were imported from African countries to work the coastal cocoa plantations that had been established in the meantime, while the surviving indigenous cultures that operated largely outside the Europeans' rule migrated south to a region of plains and jungles where they were too difficult to govern, and where only the Catholic Church bothered to try to reach them. And the friars and other religious officials who lived amongst these groups are in some cases the only reason we have external documentation of some of the languages and writing systems that existed in that part of the world at that time. In 1717, the Viceroyalty of New Granada was separated from New Spain, made into a distinct governed territory that was made up of the region that today includes Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela. This region was anchored to Europe by a trade monopoly that operated out of Caracas, which is today the capital of Venezuela, and that trade monopoly was itself dependent on natural resources, like cacao, but managed with time to also create its own local relationships with other regional colonies and trade ports, like French-held Caribbean islands and nearby British-held territories. This allowed Venezuela to build up its own credibility and power, separate from that which the Spanish homeland had granted it, which in turn allowed it to accrue its own infrastructure and reputation, including a well-respected local university, a school of music, and a broader, more fundamental education system that helped the region become known as a sort of intellectual powerhouse which drew thinkers and creatives from around the world to visit and live there. The local council of this area heard about Spain's Napoleon problem in 1808, and two years later decided to move for independence. By 1811, all the legal processes were in order, and Venezuela formally declared their independence from Spain. But the nation that emerged as a consequence of that declaration, the First Republic of Venezuela, was lost a year after its founding, due to an earthquake that destroyed their capital, followed by an invasion by a local Spanish army that reclaimed the region for Spain. A local military leader and revolutionary named Simón Bolívar led an uprising against the Spanish military presence in the area in 1813, which brought about the Second Republic of Venezuela after he won. But a popular Spanish royalist uprising led to the downfall of that republic as well, which left the country battered and in the hands of the Spanish until the final liberation of the New Granada region from Spain in 1819 and 1820 a campaign that was also led by Bolivar, which is part of why he is so renowned and respected in the area to this day. After that liberation, Gran Colombia, a name that was only applied to the region in retrospect, was declared an independent country, and that declaration of independence eventually stuck after two more years of war with Spain. The Gran Colombia region then broke up into Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela in 1831, with Panama separating from Colombia in 1903. This separation into multiple states occurred because of a conflict of vision between the military leaders who fought the Spanish together, but who had very different ideas of how governments should be run post-independence. Simón Bolívar, for his part, believed there should be a strong centralized presidency in charge, and that contradicted the beliefs of the other main military leader of that independence movement, Francisco de Pola Santander, who believed in something more constitutionally focused. The history of Venezuela post-independence and post-establishment of a formal nation, once the provinces unified into states, was defined in large part by a series of power struggles between military and political strongmen leaders who killed each other in colorful and bloody ways, and which eventually informed their foreign policy, as was the case in the Venezuelan crisis of 1902 and 1903, a period in which Venezuela was blockaded by ships owned by the UK, Germany, and Italy, because President Cipriano Castro of Venezuela decided not to pay any foreign debts or damages incurred upon European citizens during the recent Venezuelan civil wars between those strongmen leaders that I just mentioned. Venezuela eventually gave in, though it took intervention by the United States on their behalf to make that happen, 
with President Teddy Roosevelt threatening to go to war with Germany if they set foot on sovereign Venezuelan soil, as they did in fact threaten to do. This, interestingly, led to an addendum to the Monroe Doctrine, which was a policy that said, essentially, if Europeans tried to mess around in the Americas, the United States would see it as an act of war against the U.S. and respond accordingly. This addendum gave the U.S. additional self-declared powers to intervene in the affairs of smaller states in the Caribbean and Central and South America, if it felt that doing so would allow those regions to stabilize, which in turn, theoretically, would keep stronger European nations from feeling like they could come into the hemisphere and start stomping around. This is particularly interesting, even somewhat foreshadowing, in the context of what is happening in Venezuela right now. And that's what I want to talk about today. Venezuela and the situation in which they currently find themselves, and what that situation looks like, how it emerged, and what it might mean for the future of the region and international foreign policy. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. So over the past month and a half, we've been doing a drive to try to get up to 200 patrons on Patreon, and that goal was reached, and during that drive, I added the additional feature of having transcripts for all new episodes on the pages for those episodes. So if you click through and look at the show notes of these newer episodes, you will see transcriptions of the entire episode as well. And then at 200, which we reached just recently... I said that I would begin to produce additional episodes for patrons each month. So starting in June of 2019, which is the current year as I'm recording this, I will begin to produce an additional episode that all patrons at any level will have access to each month. So in addition to the one that I put out each week that is available to everybody, no matter what, there will be an additional one available to patrons on Patreon. So if you'd like to get in on that, and if you'd like to help support the show, at any level, whatever makes sense for you, whatever value you're finding in this show, you can do so at patreon.com slash let's know things. And while you're over there, let me know if you have any other ideas of things you'd like to see in the future. I'm trying to make sure to scale this show intentionally and not move too fast, not lose what I enjoy about it and not lose what I think listeners are enjoying about it. But I also do have some ideas and plans and things that I think might be cool. And I would love to hear your ideas about the same. You can do that again at patreon.com slash let's know things. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, Venezuela's Collapse is the Worst Outside of War in Decades, Economists Say. And the subtitle of the piece is, Butchers Have Stopped Selling Meat Cuts in Favor of Ophel, Fat Shavings and Cow Hooves, the Only Animal Protein Many of Their Customers Can Afford. This article is pretty harrowing, in part because the photography is so evocative, but also because the reality of the situation on the ground for normal everyday people in this country that was once one of the wealthiest in the world, and that was in recent memory. It strikes very close to home in ways that not all catastrophes of this sort do, I think. Part of the broader story here is found in the internal aspects of what's happening in Venezuela, and part is in the international response and escalation of this story. And a lot of the context and nuance in my mind is found in how one informs the other, and how a bad situation can quickly become a catastrophic situation. When the incentives in play are out of whack, the large-scale variables change, and the plans you made nationally no longer apply in the new international climate that has emerged around you. Another part of this story is what it portends for other nations around the world, especially in terms of how quickly things can spiral out of control, and how it's often the unrecognized, not panicked about ahead of time issues that are actually the most devastating when everything goes sideways and your emergency just-in-case plans are put to the test. But before we get into all of that, let's talk about Venezuela's recent history, what's happening in the country at the moment, and how Venezuela got to where it is now. Picking up from where we left off in the intro, Venezuela's fortunes changed dramatically when absolutely massive oil deposits were discovered in Lake Maracaibo in the northwest portion of the country at the beginning of the 20th century during World War I. 
Up until this point, you'll recall, the country's economy was primarily supported by agricultural exports. By 1935, though, just a few decades after the discovery, Venezuela had a GDP, a gross domestic product, which measures an economy's output in terms of all the goods and services produced in a year, higher than that of any other economy in Latin America. Leading up to 1935, President Juan Vicente Gomez, who attained his position when his predecessor left for Germany to get medical treatment, giving Gomez the chance to overthrow the existing government and install his own, Gomez and his government were able to enrich themselves massively through corruption and grift. But because the wealth flowing into the economy was so spectacular due to those oil deposits and the post-war boom and industrialization around the world, they were able to enrich the country as well, even as they siphoned off vast wealth for themselves. Gomez was the most powerful person in the country, sometimes as president, sometimes ruling from behind the scenes, running puppet presidents while remaining the de facto dictator until he died in 1935. But that system of dictatorial strongmen rule continued after his death until 1941, when President Isaias Medino Angarita took power and introduced a variety of reforms, which included among them the legislation of political parties who wanted to challenge the, until that point, single political entity that was ever allowed to hold power. After World War II, huge waves of immigration from Spain, Italy, Portugal, and France flooded into the still-growing, and still-growing wealthier by the day, country, and immigrants from other Latin American countries that lacked oil wealth also streamed in for the economic opportunities they could get in Venezuela, which they could not get back home. From 1945 until the 1980s, the story of Venezuela is that of a tug of war between competing political interests, economic surges and collapses, and a series of crises generally resolving in a newly branded republic or a new spending spree, which operated similarly but was promoted differently from the one introduced by the previous administration. In 1948, there was a coup d'etat. In 1950, there was a bungled political kidnapping that became an accidental assassination. In the late 50s, the government nationalized large chunks of the economy, converting the country into something more like a state capitalist nation than a liberal capitalist nation. Under that state capitalist system, which basically means there is capitalism, but most of the spending comes from the government rather than private enterprise. And the government owns a lot of the business-related infrastructure as well, from grocery stores to hotel chains. Under that system, the country's debt ballooned, growing to 25 times its previous size in just five years. The Venezuelan business community partitioned itself off from the government in 1958, and nine days later, the government collapsed. Three new political parties formed to help build a democratic governing system, all of the existing burgeoning ones, with the exception of the Communist Party of Venezuela, in fact. And they signed an agreement to work together to keep that democracy going. And they did for the better part of 40 years. The new democratic system was not much easier to navigate than their previous systems, however. During this period, numerous guerrilla movements emerged, there were a few armed insurgencies, and an assassination attempt on the president by the dictator of the Dominican Republic. Fidel Castro, the dictator who ruled Cuba, sponsored some insurgencies in the region, all while the Venezuelan government struggled to implement new, at times fairly revolutionary policies, like only recognizing the governments of nations with leaders elected by popular vote. Debts incurred by previous governments crippled a lot of the country's more democratic-leaning plans, though, and it took them about a decade to get that sorted out, though the model they used to pay those debts without breaking the bank ran out of steam in the 1970s and culminated with the so-called Venezuelan Black Friday event of 1983, when their economy suffered the slow-growing consequences of those money-saving policies. That said, despite that eventual shortfall, the Venezuelan economy did pretty dang well from the 1950s until the mid-1970s, due in part to those policies, and in part because the Arab-Israeli War, sometimes called the Yom Kippur War, had caused the average price of oil to skyrocket, leaving petrostates like Venezuela in a great position to grow massively wealthy without having to try too hard. The Venezuelan government nationalized a few industries, like iron, during this time. There was another oil crisis in the 70s, which brought even more wealth. And finally, the oil industries in the country were nationalized as well. Oil prices began to drop in the 1980s, though, 
which slowed down the Venezuelan economy substantially, and the government eventually had to devalue their currency in 1983, leaving it with a great deal of newly acquired debt, and leaving locals with vastly lower standards of living than they had enjoyed just a few years prior. The government attempted a few new economic policies, intending to get things back to where they were, but none of them worked terribly well, and the stage was set for governmental upset, which arrived in the shadow of the aforementioned Black Friday of 1983 event, and the subsequent riots, coup attempts throughout the early 90s, and the eventual elevation of one of the attempted coup orchestrators, Hugo Chavez, into the presidency, where he remained from 1999 until 2013, when he died. Chavez swept into power on the back of what he branded a Bolivarian revolution, referencing Simón Bolívar, the guy who was partly responsible for defeating the Spanish back in the days of Venezuelan independence. This revolution took the shape of populist democratic values couched in the language of socialist rhetoric. So the government's priorities would become economic independence, the equitable distribution of wealth, and an end to government corruption. But all of these ideas were presented using language that was quite familiar to anyone who had lived through the Cold War. Not communist ideals, but similar language and points of view. By all indications, Chavez did manage to do some of what he claimed he wanted to do for the country, though there was still a great deal of opposition to his rule, which was very much aligned with the country's history of strongmen leaders holding power for long periods of time, enriching themselves and their friends along the way, and mostly succeeding because of resource wealth, rather than because they were particularly skilled economic or community leaders. There were a few attempts on Chavez's life, and he was ousted for a few days during a coup attempt in 2002. There was also a national strike that lasted from December 2002 until February 2003, which included the state oil company, PDVSA, and that strike crippled the economy, slicing 27% off the country's GDP that year, and costing the oil industry somewhere in the neighborhood of $13.3 billion. The economy has been up and down in the years since that strike, and many outside experts who have looked at the data that we have available seem to think that the country throughout the early 2000s could have had another oil boom, but the government was siphoning off most of the profits for itself to enrich those in charge, rather than reinvesting those resources in the oil industry or the country, which has led to those heavy swings instead, and steadily tighter controls over the slowly fading national economy. When Chavez died of cancer in 2013, the current president, Nicolás Maduro, was elected, though he had already been picked by Chavez as his successor before he died, and he was vice president leading up to that death. The election for his appointment was also shortened, so you could debate whether the term elected is the right word to use in this particular context. However he got there, though, Maduro did win the election that came after that first shortened one, and an outside audit of the election seems to indicate that he won it legitimately, if not by any great margin. He got 50.61% of the vote, compared to the 49.12% of the votes that went to his challenger. In 2014, the price of a barrel of oil plummeted from $100 to $40, which devastated the country's economy, including many of the social programs they had in place to make sure food and other necessities were available to everyone. In 2015, the opposition party, those competing with Maduro's party, gained a majority in the Venezuelan parliament. Later that year, Venezuela had the world's highest inflation rate at over 100%. In 2016, Maduro declared an economic emergency, revealed the extent of the crisis the country was undergoing, and expanded his powers for the duration of that emergency. Colombian borders were temporarily opened to Venezuelans who wanted to cross into their country to buy food and basic household items, since these things were in short supply in Venezuela. In 2017, Venezuela went through a constitutional crisis, with opposition party leaders calling Maduro a dictator because he had been countermanding decisions made by the National Assembly on a regular basis, ever since the opposition party became dominant within the Assembly. He then stripped the assembly of its powers and later barred the opposition party from taking part in the next presidential vote. Also in 2017, the U.S. government under President Donald Trump imposed new sanctions on the Venezuelan state oil company and some Venezuelan officials, which made their already bad problem substantially worse. 
Maduro won the 2018 presidential election, but these results were called into question by watchdogs from around the world. The results have been declared fraudulent, and in January of 2019, the OAS, the Organization of American States, approved a resolution to not formally recognize Maduro's presidency as of the 10th of January 2019. And that, all of that, brings us to where we are today, with a collection of events broadly described when reported upon as the 2019 Venezuelan protests but which actually encompass a series of moves and countermoves by the existing Maduro government, a would-be replacement government supported by the National Assembly that I mentioned a moment ago, a large number of international governments, and the ground-level human consequences of Maduro's actions and inactions, the economic situation in the country, and the struggle between these two sides as they've played out over the course of the last few years. The competitor to Maduro's power, a man named Juan Guaido, is the National Assembly president. He was declared the acting president of Venezuela by the National Assembly on January 11, 2019, the day after that election, which Maduro won by a large percentage but which most outside observers say was rigged in Maduro's favor. Guaido has been calling for protests, has gained the support of some members of the military and police, has hosted rallies that have drawn thousands of people out to hear him speak, and has been detained by the government's intelligence services and threatened with prison. Those protests escalated, as did the rhetoric from both sides. In February of 2019, the government's military blocked roads from Colombia to keep humanitarian aid from entering the country, a collection of countries, both in Latin America and around the world, decided to recognize Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela, and the U.S. has been one of the most enthusiastic in this regard, which seemed to backfire a little bit, as it has given Maduro, who is still in control of the government, the ability to point at the U.S.'s position and say, look, I told you, they are all against me. It's an attempted coup from the U.S., and Guaido is just their puppet in their efforts to take over our country. A bunch of high-up leaders from the government and military defected from Maduro's government and threw their support behind Guaido in February, and a large number of Venezuelan troops defected to other countries. In March, there was the first of many nationwide blackouts. Maduro said it was the result of sabotage, probably from the U.S., while industry experts from the region attributed it to a lack of maintenance of the electrical grid and a lack of technical expertise to make repairs caused by the brain drain that has been occurring as people flee the country for other countries in the area on humanitarian grounds. Increasingly massive protests have occurred around the country, but the largest took place in the capital city of Caracas, as electricity, food, and water have become increasingly scarce. Some of these protests were captured in photographs by journalists, and they show pretty graphic examples of people being brutalized by government troops, wielding melee weapons, tear gas, and guns filled with rubber bullets. Some humanitarian aid finally entered the country, via the Red Cross, mid-April, and some National Assembly members have been detained by the government, which is very much against the law. On April 30th, there was an intended uprising led by Guaido and several dozen military personnel, which was meant to be a coup, but which ended up being more of a protest that led to a clash with government forces, which in turn led to four deaths, over 50 military personnel being expelled from the military by Maduro, and the firing of the head of Venezuelan intelligence, who publicly backed Guaido at the event. More National Assembly members were arrested by Maduro's government at the beginning of May, and as of the moment I'm recording this at least, Maduro is still in power, Guaido is still free and publicly raging against the current Venezuelan regime, and the situation on the ground is growing progressively worse for the everyday Venezuelan. And when I say it's getting worse, it's really, really bad. Looping back around to that piece in the Times, it describes an economy that has experienced the single worst economic collapse, short of a war happening within a country, in the last 45 years. It's worse than what happened in Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe. It's worse than what happened in the Soviet Union when the government collapsed. It's worse than what Cuba experienced in the 90s when their whole economy fell apart. From that article, quote, as the country's economy plummeted, armed gangs took control of entire towns, public services collapsed, and the purchasing power of most Venezuelans has been reduced to a couple of kilograms of flour a month. 
In markets, butchers hit by regular blackouts jostle to sell decomposing stock by sunset. Former laborers scavenge through garbage piles for leftovers and recyclable plastic. Dejected retailers make dozens of trips to the bank in hopes of depositing several pounds worth of bills made worthless by hyperinflation, end quote. This would seem, as I mentioned before, to be a catastrophe largely created by the governments dependent on oil wealth, compounded by the culture of grift and authoritarianism that has seemed to be systemic within the Venezuelan government more or less since they declared independence. Outside forces, especially U.S. policies, have not been kind to the country or its situation either, though. Another snippet from that Times piece, quote, the crisis has been compounded by American sanctions intended to force Mr. Maduro to cede power to the nation's opposition leader, Juan Guaido. The Trump administration's recent sanctions on Venezuela's state oil company have made it difficult for the government to sell its main commodity, oil. Together with the American ban on trading Venezuelan bonds, the administration has made it harder for Venezuela to import any goods, including food and medication. Mr. Maduro blames the widespread hunger and lack of medical supplies on the United States and its opposition allies. But most independent economists say the recession began years before the sanctions, which at most accelerated the collapse. End quote. Whatever the cause or causes here, Venezuela, despite having the world's largest proven oil reserves, is producing very little oil. Their production levels have fallen more rapidly in the past year than Iraq's did after the U.S. invaded in 2003. And again, that's a comparison between a country that is being invaded and a country that is just being mismanaged. Venezuela has also seen 10% of its population flee across the border in some cases traveling vast distances through mountainous terrain to get themselves to other countries in which they might find more safety and opportunity. One-tenth of the country has fled the country. Take a moment to think about that and what that even looks like. The country's currency is approaching 10 million percent inflation, and the GDP is predicted to have shrunk a total of about 62 percent by the end of 2019, that decline beginning in 20. 13, when Maduro came into power. As noted in the Times article, the Soviet Union's GDP decline, as they were collapsing, topped out at only about 30%, compared to Venezuela's 62%. There are some pretty devastating stories of how locals live their lives in the country at the moment, related in this piece. You can find other stories, other perspectives elsewhere, in other publications as well, which are equally horrible and eye-opening. It's worth remembering in cases like this, I think, that although we often hear about the upper-level high society intrigue that occurs in these sorts of situations, in countries that are not our own, most of the story is actually taking place below the news and involves people who are not powerful enough to garner international attention, living lives that were less stable to begin with and which are often completely upended if not destroyed by this sort of process. So while it's definitely a fascinating story to watch in some ways, because of the cultural, political, and economic history and complexity and significance of this situation, it's also important not to lose sight of the fact that real people, numbering in the tens of millions, are suffering immensely as the powerful people running their societies take pot shots at each other on television and social media, and as wielders of influence wrestle with each other for slices of a pie that will almost certainly remain the exclusive domain of people in that higher economic caste, fewer and fewer crumbs are falling to those beneath the surface. There are a few other points that I think are worth making about what's happening in Venezuela right now, beyond a reminder of the human perspective on all of this. The first is that this is indeed a multifaceted situation. And even if we account for local mismanagement and corruption, international intervention, and the multiple massive personalities involved, there are still countless other variables at play here, some that are potentially visible if we look hard enough, and some that will almost certainly remain unseen, because they are difficult to measure, troublesome to define, or so well intertwined with other variables that they would be tricky to identify even if we caught sight of them. 
This is a good point to remember because it can help us avoid an over-reliance on simple-seeming solutions and can allow us to call false, or at least incomplete, on answers provided to us by our leaders and experts who may have an ingrained bias that they are pushing with their proposals, or which could illustrate their ignorance to us via answers that are not really answers or which aren't relevant to this particular situation. The second is that petro-states, countries that are primarily reliant on oil and other fossil fuels for their economic well-being, and other nations that lean heavily on just one natural resource for their position on the international stage, that is a wobbly foundation upon which to build anything. And it's shocking how many nations are fully or partially in this boat, not to mention how many corporations are fully engaged in defending the continued existence of, sources of, and unregulated market for their particular product, whether that's natural gas, diamonds, raw materials like cobalt, or potable drinking water. There's no avoiding this kind of thing, in the short term at least. Our economic system allows us to specialize in this way, and there are a lot of benefits of doing so especially in the globalized world in which we find ourselves here at the beginning of the 21st century. But it might be prudent, looking at these types of collapses, to consider how we might diversify, safely and non-destructively, elements of that global web upon which we all depend. Yes, it can be useful for different areas to specialize in different things, but every time oil prices drop, that crushes some economies. And those portions of that web, in turn, begin to slacken, begin to collapse, which has knock-on effects throughout that web, everything being connected, as it is. Third, it is remarkable how quickly any institution, government or otherwise, can collapse when the fundamentals disappear and things like trust in the economy, in the system, disappear. These sorts of things are difficult to quantify, but you notice them when they're gone. They are the reason you no longer trust your own country's currency and are no longer willing to trust that your elections were held in an honest way, that the results were legit. Many load-bearing aspects of society are fragile in this way, and although every situation is different, looking at this kind of rapid collapse of such institutions makes it abundantly clear how important such things are, despite our inability to accurately quantify them. Now, it's anybody's guess what will happen next in Venezuela. I'm not going to speculate with any specificity about that here, though I suspect we will see a relatively more stable dynamic of some kind clamp into place within the next six months. I just can't imagine the local forces that be managing to stagger on as they are now beyond that, though perhaps that's just a lack of imagination on my part, and they will make it work despite changing very little. The country will almost certainly be a very different place afterward, either way, when the dust has settled and they start to rebuild, with a far lower population and a badly damaged international reputation. A steep hill to climb in terms of rebuilding lost trust and repairing their devastated economy. For the locals' sake, whether they are experiencing the worst of things or just getting a taste of what could happen in the future right now, I sincerely hope things look up, and as soon as possible, because again, although it can be interesting to see a change in dynamic when it comes to institutions and the machinations of powerful people and entities, and to imagine how things might change for the better as a consequence of such tumult, it's the people at the bottom who tend to suffer the most. And even if things improve in some fundamental way as a result, that is the case. That potential future change, beneficial as it might be for the country or world in the long term, does not make a normal Venezuelan's day-to-day -day reality any more palatable or survivable. It's possible, in other words, to be attentive and interested intellectually in what's happening on the macro scale, while also allowing ourselves to feel the immense human cost of major world events on the micro scale, even if we do not personally know anyone affected. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. A huge thanks to everybody who is already supporting the show via Patreon or some other method. That means a whole lot and I really appreciate it. It is the reason I am able to commit the time that I do each week to this show. And I love being able to make this show. So I am truly grateful to everybody who is helping support this show in some way, shape, or form. Thank you very, very much.
The book that I'd like to recommend today is the eighth book in the Expanse series. And actually, I think I'd just like to recommend the series as a whole. This is the eighth book in a nine book series. The ninth one, I think, is coming out in 2020. The eighth book is called Tiamat's Wrath. And the whole series has just been a whole lot of fun. The TV show that has been made out of this series is only about three seasons in, and I've really enjoyed those. The show was recently bought from Sci-Fi by Amazon Prime, so I think they'll be investing even more money into it and hopefully keeping the vibe that has made it such a winning show in my mind thus far. But the book series, in my opinion, is even better, and it's much further along in the storyline than the TV series. And it's set in a solar system that is highly politically confrontational. The Earth has something like 30 billion people on it, and the majority of people live on some kind of basic income because they just don't need that many people working. But that's also kind of a ceiling on the majority of people who live there. Mars is a planet that has kind of a military pseudo-dictatorship that has everybody oriented around trying to terraform the planet over a long period of time, and everybody lives under domes currently. And then there's the outer planets with a bunch of people who live on moons and moonlets and asteroids asteroids and in space stations, and these are people who are essentially living in kind of the colonies of the solar system, and who are taken advantage of as a consequence of that. This sets the scene for kind of an outside factor that emerges and changes everything, and sets up the major powers that be to engage in a major confrontation that was already building, but it also presents some new opportunities for different forces to work together in interesting ways. I don't want to give away much more than that, but it is absolutely worth checking out if you get the opportunity. The world building, or in this case, solar system and universe building in this series is just incredible. The technology works in a very convincing way. It is hard science fiction, so the science and technology in this series works in very believable ways. And the characters are a whole lot of fun. The storyline itself is just wonderful if you get the chance. And even if you're not really into science fiction, if it's not something that you've engaged with before, but you're looking for something that is very politically engaging or militarily engaging that has some engaging characters, this is a really great place to start. The first book, I believe, is called Leviathan Wakes. And the eighth book that I am on currently and enjoying so far is called Tiamat's Wrath. And that is the Expanse series by James S.A. Corey. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. You can find out more about the tour that I'm currently on at becomingtour.com. And you can find my advice column about life at somethoughtsaboutliving.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I am most active on Twitter and Instagram at Colin is my name. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.